my name is Rodrigue Turgeon. I'm the um, I'm the co uh, uh, lead national program at Mining Watch Canada, um, and as well a lawyer here practicing in Quebec. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you uh, uh, this panel for you today. Um, uh, just to let you know as well that the presentation is uh, recorded uh, and will be um, available uh, after the presentation uh, on our different websites. Um, and others, uh, an important element before really starting the presentation, I'd like to um, make, um, you know, uh, une, une reconnaissance territoriale du territoire sur lequel uh, nous sommes situés. Donc, la ville de Montréal se trouve sur uh, un territoire qui est occupé depuis des millénaires par plusieurs nations autochtones. Um, et uh, présentement, uh, c'est toujours le cas. Plusieurs nations uh, l'occupent, et en uh, particulier la nation Mohawk, la nation Anishinaabe uh, et, et, et plusieurs autres. Au Québec, il y a 11 nations autochtones plusieurs de leurs membres occupent ce territoire. Um, so, yeah, welcome to this panel on the deep sea mining. Um, well, the importance to stop this practice because it's a unique opportunity to avoid an ocean cat catastrophe. So, um, my pleasure is to uh, present you, introduce you to our panelists. So first we have uh, from right to the left, Matt Gianni, the co-founder and political and policy advisor at the Deep Sea Conser Conservation Coalition. He's made a long uh, ride to come here. Um, he's based in Amsterdam. And at his left, we have Susanna Fuller, um, the vice president of operation and projects at Ocean North Canada, based in Halifax. Is that correct? Yeah. Thanks. Um, and remotely, we have the pleasure to have with us T Tita Kara from the Civil Society Forum of Tonga, uh, an island situated in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, and we also have the pleasure to have with us Catherine Kumans. She's my colleague at Mining Watch Canada. She's occupying the uh, function of the Asia Pacific Coordinator and as well very involved in the uh, deep sea mining. Uh, coalition to 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 ban and stop this practice. So I'd like as well to thank uh, the sponsoring organization. So first the Collective Cup Kings for uh, facilitating this this um, this event, and as well the uh, Deep Sea Mining Campaign, Mining Watch Canada, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, Civil Society Forum of Tonga, and Oceans North. Um. So I believe the first introduction is made. Matt, Jenny, will be your time to shine. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, <clears throat> and appreciate you all coming here. Um, just to mention that the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition is a coalition of over 100 organizations worldwide. Um, Mining Watch Canada is a member. Oceans North. Uh, there are organizations such as Greenpeace, which who's here. Uh, WWF, Conservation International, a lot of grassroots organizations from um quite a few uh countries from around the world but uh just by way of uh, kind of introducing the issue uh and i'm going to focus primarily on the movement toward mining the deep ocean in the international portions of the world's ocean which cover about half of the overall seabed uh of the um, of the global ocean uh and the the there was well the as as you, as you may know the, um, the 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 mining regime for what is called for the international seabed area was established in the 1970s um, uh, and it's now part of the united nations convention on the, on the law of the sea and the negotiators in those days in the 1970s thought mining the deep ocean was a really good idea vast amounts of of uh, mineral materials cobalt, nickel, copper, manganese, uh, silver, gold, uh, zinc. Um, and they thought the world would get rich off the mining. Uh, they also agreed, and this was a, a very progressive 
um, development international law that anyone who went out to mine the international seabed area would have to share the wealth with the rest of the world, um, in particular with developing countries, and that all countries should have an opportunity to mine the deep ocean in the international seabed area, not just the rich countries that had the technological capability of doing so and the financial wherewithal to do so. And this was known as the common heritage of humankind, this principle that that the, this vast untapped wealth would be shared by all, all could participate in its benefits, both through mining it and through sharing the royalties. So uh, the International Seabed Authority, which is the institution that was established once the law of the sea uh, came into force in 1994 to implement these provisions and progressively develop an internet regulations to allow for mining by first uh, allowing for exploration and then ultimately transitioning to exploitation, the mining itself, um, and has been progressively moving in that direction um, for the past, what would that be now, 26 years? Is my math correct? 28. Um, but the pace is now picked up. Uh, and and the, the, the reason is, is because certain companies, including one here in Canada, actually, or technically based in Canada, is pushing to get into deep sea bed mining and has kind of gamed the, um, the system, legally speaking, or quasi-legally speaking, there is some consider, uh, concern as to exactly how they got the licenses for the area that they did get the licenses, uh, through getting a small island developing state to sponsor it to trigger a rule that requires that they think will get them a license beginning in the second half of 20, as early as the second half of 2023. So the question is, so so good idea in the 1970s, share the wealth, untold riches. So what's the problem? Well, we now know a lot more about the deep ocean than we did, or our, our predecessors did, the negotiators in the 1970s. And rather than kind of summarize that, I, I, I just bear with me. I'll read uh, about a page out of a scientist statement that was signed by over 600 scientists worldwide calling for a pause or a moratorium in effect uh, on moving toward deep sea bed mining, mostly scientists and policy people, including myself. Uh, and uh, let me just read this out to you. They basically say the deep sea is home to a significant proportion of Earth's biodiversity with most species yet to be discovered. The richness and diversity of organisms in the deep sea supports ecosystem processes necessary for the Earth's natural systems to function. The deep ocean also constitutes more than 90% of the biosphere, the living habitable portions of our planet, and plays a key role in climate regulation, fisheries production, and elemental recycling. It is an integral part of the culture and well-being of local communities, and the sea fuller forms part of the common heritage of humankind. However, deep sea ecosystems are currently under stress from a number of anthropogenic stressors, including climate change, bottom trawling, and pollution. And deep sea mining would add to these stressors, resulting in the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem functioning that would be irreversible on multi-generational timescales. And some scientists say, for example, the mining in the Pacific uh, would result in species that depend on the nodules that it would it would take uh, species that depend on the the kind of the hard substrate the nodules in the Pacific millions of years to recover because it takes millions of years for these 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 um, minerals to kind of reform uh, or reprecipitate out of the water and even the the motile sediment infauna, the things crawling around in the sediment around where the nodules are, would take hundreds to thousands of years to recover from the impacts of mining. And amongst the kind of concerns or the impacts, they say the direct loss of in unique and ecologically important species and populations as a result of the degradation and destruction or elimination of seafloor habitat. So just amongst some of the other, and if you're out there listening, um, <laughs> don't be shocked. Uh, but uh, amongst the other impacts will be the production of large persistent sediment plumes that will affect midwater and deep ocean ecosystems beyond the mining sites themselves, the interruption of, of important ecological processes, uh, the resuspension and release of sediment, metals, and toxins into the water column uh, that could get into uh, the marine food chain. Uh, and noise pollution um, from industrial machine activity on the ocean floor and in the water column as they pump the uh, the the um, the minerals uh, up to the surface. In some cases, several thousand uh, 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 meters 
uh, from the seafloor up to the surface. And finally, very uncertain impacts on carbon sequestration dynamics in deep ocean carbon storage. Um, and this is both an impact that could uh, interfere with the biological carbon pump um, of species drawing carbon down through the water column into the deep ocean, as well as the carbon stored in deep ocean sediments. And so for this reason, these scientists, the ones that have signed this and others, um, have called for a moratorium or a pause on deep sea bed mining. And many of them say, basically, it will take us years to get the information we need to be able to make informed decisions as to whether mining can be allowed or permitted without causing damage to the marine environment. But all indications to date, particularly with the, the, in the area where the seabed authority would like including AB and AMRO, BBVA, Lloyd's Banking Group, NatWest, etc. And earlier this year, for example, the European Investment Bank, which bills itself as the biggest multilateral financial institution in the world and one of the largest providers of climate finance, added deep sea mining to its list of excluded activities under the heading of projects unacceptable in climate and environment terms. And so we've got a growing number of, of banks, institutions, companies that are saying, we don't want these, these, we will not use these metals and we do not want them in our supply chain, deep sea metals. Um, and of course, there are organizations from around the world, such as the members of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition and, and many others. Um, and a number of countries now have stepped up to the plate and have been calling for a moratorium. And that includes Palau, Fiji, Federated States of Micronesia, Samoa, New Zealand, Germany, Costa Rica, Chile, Spain, Panama, and Ecuador, and France has come out, President Emmanuel Macron calling for an actual ban on deep sea bed mining. But most importantly, uh, Pacific peoples, peoples from around the world, and in particular peoples in the Pacific, the Pacific Blue Line, the Pacific Council of Churches, and we'll hear more from those from our partners in, their speak, uh, in the Pacific from, from Tita uh, and Catherine. So let me stop there and hand over. Thanks, Matt. Um, and so, so we thought to to give you a, a good idea of the extent of of what's very at stake. The the best way to show you is would be to present a video. So, um, if our uh, techni technician team is is uh, ready to uh, to um, broadcast it, um, we'll we, we'll be glad to present you the Blue Peril video. That's a collaboration between interpret the deep sea mining campaign and Oceanian dialogue and it's uh, supported by Mining Watch Canada as well. This video provides a disturbing picture of the far reaching impacts of deep sea mining for marine ecosystems and Pacific Island communities. It focuses on Tonga and Nauru sponsored license uh, areas in the Pacific oceans uh, of the Canadian mining company, the Metals company. The, vi the video is a visual investigation of the impacts of seabed mining based on best public publicly available scientific data and internationally accredited uh, oceanographic models and spatial imagery programs. Um, so you can find more info about this, uh, this video on the uh, website blueperil.org. So um, if we're ready to uh, Launch it. The Pacific Ocean is our home. It is who we are. It is the source of life, the heart of our traditions and economies. It is home to marine life we depend on. As we speak, our source of life and our identity are threatened by deep sea mining. The damage it will cause could be irreversible, affecting millions of people in the Pacific. Imagine waking up one day to a lifeless ocean. What will become of us? Some of our own governments have joined with companies in a rush to mine the ocean floor. Papua New Guinea, Kiribati, Tonga, Nauru and Cook Islands 
have helped mining companies gain contracts to explore areas of seabed in their national and international waters. Many of their citizens are strongly opposed and want to stop this industry before it's too late. Deep sea mining in international waters is regulated by the International Seabed Authority or ISA, a body set up under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The ISA has issued 17 contracts for exploration of the deep sea floor of the Clarion Clipperton Zone or CCZ, an area of the Pacific Ocean nearly the size of Europe, covering about 6 million square kilometers between Hawaii and Kiribati to Mexico. One third of the CCZ has been set aside for mining small rocks called polymetallic nodules. These sit on the sea floor three to six kilometers deep and contain metals such as cobalt, nickel and manganese. The largest mining operation in world history is about to start in the backyard of Pacific Island States. The ISA has conflicting responsibilities to develop and regulate seabed mining and to protect the ocean from its impacts. But how can these roles be fulfilled by the one organization? For the deep sea life of the CCZ, nodules are breeding and feeding grounds and provide the only hard surfaces animals can attach to. Most of the species that live on and around nodules are found nowhere else on Earth. In its rush to develop mining, the ISA has given away nearly all of the nodule-rich area to exploration contracts. Many unique species and entire ecosystems may become extinct even before we know them. In 2012, after most of the exploration contracts had already been granted, the ISA declared nine protected areas called Areas of Particular Environmental Interest, or APEIs, where exploration and mining are not permitted. All of the nine APEIs were allocated around the edges of the exploration contracts, where nodule abundance is low. In 2021, the ISA established four additional APEIs only two smaller APEIs are located in the central nodule reach region. It is clear that the ISA's priority is the profit of the deep sea mining industry. What about the many of us who rely on a healthy ocean? Concern about the impacts of deep sea mining has led to widespread calls to halt its development. Marine science and policy experts, international fisheries bodies, global businesses, the IUCN, governments and civil society, including in the Pacific, have called for a moratorium or an outright ban. Tonga, Nauru and Kiribati have been persuaded by promises of great wealth to enter into exploration contracts with the Metals Company, or TMC, previously known as Deep Green. In June 2021, Nauru triggered an ISA rule that will allow Nauru Ocean Resources, NORI, 100% owned by TMC, to start mining in two years, even if the other 167 ISA member states have not yet agreed on regulations for mining. This is reckless. In documents filled with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, TMC admits that its mining operations could be just as destructive 
as land-based mining and could cause the extinction of entire species. TMC's publicity campaign, on the other hand, downplays the potentially serious impacts of deep sea mining and the rich and unique life that is at risk. TMC hired the architect Spierke Ingels Group to produce visual designs which create a false picture that the deep sea mining operations will be environmentally friendly with no impact or waste. Interpret, together with Deep Sea Mining Campaign and Oceanian Dialogue, conducted a visual investigation to counter TMC's greenwashing. We use the best publicly available science and environmental data to model the devastating and irreversible damage that deep seabed mining could bring to marine ecosystems and habitats. Contrary to what TMC says, the clarion Clipperton zone is not a vast underwater desert. To explore its rich biodiversity, we use a photographic survey of 88,000 images of seafloor habitat. The survey was carried out by an underwater drone in three seafloor landscapes most common throughout the region. Our image analysis of one track along which photographs were taken revealed about half of them recorded one or more deep sea animals. Here, we assume the distribution of these images containing species across a mining site. This survey not only covered just a tiny fraction of this vast region, but also came from an ISA protected area with low nodule abundance. Richer nodule areas such as nori could provide a habitat for millions of living organisms. TMC's mining operations could destroy a vast and little understood ecosystem. Nori D is one of Nauru's four contract areas. It is here that TMC plans to start mining by 2024, but has yet to provide any credible information on potential mining impact. We use publicly available engineering estimates to simulate for the first time TMC's mining footprint. We incorporate full-scale commercial nodule collectors, which will be much larger than industry prototypes, into our simulation. One day of mining is likely to destroy approximately two square kilometers of the seafloor. Over one month, approximately 40 square kilometers. And in one year, an area between 400 and 600 square kilometers will disappear. At a minimum, a single mining operation over a 30-year contract could impact an area of seabed similar to the land area of Hawaii. If the results of an experiment by the research institute Geomar show that the disturbance tracks left by a small vehicle had not recovered after 37 years, then the damage from full-scale mining operations could be irreversible. Nodule collectors plowing through the soft sediment of the seabed will produce plumes that will spread far beyond the immediate mining site. The waste from the 24-7 processing of mined nodules on surface ships will create another plume around 1,000 meters or below. To better understand how these two plumes might spread, we use open drift. 
a state-of-the-art platform for predicting how ocean currents transport particles and objects, such as oil drifts and microplastics. We track virtual sediment particles using ocean currents derived from a global ocean model. Together with a wide search of the scientific literature, this provides a well-grounded visual demonstration of the spread of plumes. Here, we model the seabed plume in the Nori D contract area using open drift. In just over 30 days, virtual sediment particles released 8 meters from the seafloor travel over 200 kilometers. Drifting far outside the Nori D block, the particles could impact seafloor life along the plume trajectory. Thousands of species, many still unknown to science, that evolve in a stable, unchanging environment over millennia could go extinct. Here, we model the mid-water discharge plume in the Tonga contract area. Virtual sediment particles were released just below 1,000 meters and allowed to sink and spread horizontally with different ocean currents. Along the way, the plume may harm free-swimming species, including whales, turtles, dolphins, sharks, and tuna, for example, by clogging their gills. Extending our simulation runtime, we predict that it will only take three months for the discharge plume to reach Hawaiian waters, a unique marine ecosystem, a source of livelihood and home for its custodians. The plume's potential toxic impacts are a critical unknown. Our visualizations vividly demonstrate, for the first time, the vast area of the Pacific expected to be impacted by deep sea mining. How will the many plumes from the rush to mine the ocean floor affect Pacific communities and all of us? Our oceans are already under so much stress, from climate change to overfishing and pollution. At this point, we really cannot consider any new activities that would add further stress to our ocean. Science is just starting to catch up with what oceanic people have always known. Our ocean is fluid with no boundaries. Everything is interconnected from our coral reefs to the deep sea. And these coastal communities who rely on our ocean as a source of life. Imagine waking up one day to a lifeless ocean. What would become of us? If companies get their way, deep sea mining is not a matter of if, but when. As oceanic people, we have a responsibility to our children and our children's children to preserve our kinship with the living ocean, which is so much a part of who we are. If we protect our ocean, we protect our home, our way of life, our identity and our future. Civil society in the Pacific and around the world are working to stop deep sea mining. We encourage you to find out more. Thanks. So our next speaker uh, will have the privilege to um, introduce Tita Kara. So she's from the Civil so Society Forum of Tonga. 
she will be talking to us remotely through Zoom. Um, and I believe you've uh, witnessed the importance for the Tongan people uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to speak about this uh, issue, the importance to stop and ban deep sea mining activities. So Tita, if you can hear us, now would be uh, your time. We, are, we, we can see you here in the room. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we, we do. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Billy Latitakara. Um, it has been introduced. I represent the Umbrella NGO from Tonga. Uh, you would have seen the movie, um, the video of um, where we are actually located. But as a sponsoring um, state, I feel that it's only right that I joined. And um, today has changed another portion of my life uh, because I understand what we're doing is very important. Hackers wanted to come in and destroy the space, but they are not going to sign in the voice of people like me who are frontliners to the impact of climate change and the threat of deep sea mining to our livelihood. Um, Tonga is only over 100,000 people, but over 90% of our people depend on the sea and the ocean. Um, more than 80% of our people are coastal people. We live off the sea. The ocean means everything to us. And the threat um, that deep sea mining posts for me and my people is something that I can't stand quietly on the sideline and watch while some company wanted to make money off the resources, thinking that it's okay. The Pacific has already experienced horrendous um, experience of mine testing, uh, of bomb testing in the Pacific. We're still you know, trying to get rid of that legacy. And in that excuse was for the sake of humanity. Now it's another you know, posted question that we should do it for the sake of humanity. But enough is enough. We depend on the sea. We live connectively by the ocean. I might be in Tonga, but if you saw the, the spread of the bloom, it will come all the way to Tonga within a month. The excuses that the company has actually flagged for Tonga is, you are okay, you are safe. It's far out there. No, it's not within a month is going to hurt us as well. So hence the sensitivity and the importance of the ocean that we can't ignore. I was given to talk about the responsibility of the state. And I think the foremost has been echoed in our constitution is that the state must ensure our freedom, our freedom to live, to choose how to pray and to be depth three. I know the whole excuses that the government are making is that we have money. Comparatively, the little bit that has been promised is nothing compared to what we will we'll lose if the state is not going to abide by its obligation to protect Tonga. There are few um, clear um, conventions that Tonga is obligated under, under the UNCLOS, we, the state, is actually obligated to ensure that the companies do certain things. You know, they're obligated to ensure that best environmental practice is being done. They are obligated to ensure the availability of resources for compensation if anything will ever happen. They're obligated to ensure that the company is not to EIA. These are under the UNCLOS. But under the principle of Rio Declaration, we're obligated to protect the environment. We have under the Convention of Biodiversity to secure the life of the organism um, in the ocean and our environment as well. So we have so many obligations that for a normal human being, they would not actually bring in a thief into your house knowing that you have precious treasure in there because at the end, they will steal it. And this is something that we are actually standing very firmly on the civil society together with a whole host of our Pacific Islanders saying to a total ban 
on deep sea mining. And the state should listen to us because the state represent a only small number of people who come in only for a certain term until they get out. But the result in the liability will fall on the shoulder of the likes of me and my children and my grandchildren. So this is something that we must speak out on. Say no to deep sea mining. It's not enough scientific evidence and the precautionary approach is not being exercised by the state. It's part of its responsibility. So there is insufficient scientific evidence to prove that this is going to be all right. So we'll say no, don't start, don't go there, just a full stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tita. Can you hear the uh, round of applause for you from where you are? <laughs> I, I, I can tell you uh, your presentation was very, uh, um, very appreciated here from Montreal. Thanks a lot. Is there anything you would you'd like to add before we uh, pass the uh, the mic to the next uh, panelist? No, I think uh, the peril uh, blue peril has said a lot, even though it's compromises uh, by the hackers. But I think the message was clear. I stand hundred percent with my organization behind it, saying that we support. The message is clear. There shouldn't be any deep sea mining. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tita. Um, our next speaker will be my colleague, Catherine Kuman. So uh, as I said earlier, she is the Asia Pacific coordinator at Mining Watch Canada. Um, she will talk us more about who are the actual Canadian corporation behind this, um, this enterprise to uh, uh, affect the deep sea mining. Uh, the deep sea, the deep sea bed. Sorry. Um, so, Catherine. Thank you very much, Rodrigue, and thank you for everyone who's uh, suffered through uh, the hacking and is still with us. So, as we've seen, the video blue peril focuses on the far-reaching impacts of deep sea bed mining on marine ecosystems, but also on the Pacific island communities that rely on those ecosystems. It exposes the projected impacts of deep sea bed mining from exploration licenses in an area of the Pacific called the Clarion Clipperton Zone. And these are licenses in the video that are held by a Canadian mining company, a company that wants to mine the seabed. And the company is called the Metals Company. And Tita has discussed the Metals Company's partnership relationship with her island nation of Tonga. The metals company actually holds three licenses for exploration of polymetallic nodules, which we saw in the video, those small round uh, rock-like formations. And these are the polymetallic nodules in the Clarion Clipperton zone. And these licenses are held through sponsorship agreements with South Pacific island nations of Tonga, Nauru, and Kiribati. Canada's The Metals Company is the most vocal promoter of deep seabed mining. And it's in the forefront of pushing to see the actual mining of the seabeds to start as soon as possible. In fact, Canadian companies have long been leading the charge to extract mining profits by destroying biodiverse, highly fragile, and poorly understood deep seabed ecosystems. I'm going to briefly sketch the roles of the two main Canadian companies that have been involved. One is called Nautilus Minerals and the other is the Metals Company. So Canadian mining company Nautilus Minerals actually secured the first global permit for deep seabed mining as early as 2011. The permit was granted by the government of Papua New Guinea and it was for mining of hydrothermal vents, um, which are considered the cradle of life on Earth. And these hydrothermal vents were in the territorial waters of the Pacific country, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea coastal communities, supported by the Deep Sea Mining Campaign and Mining Watch Canada, 
fought against the proposed mining and the company eventually went bankrupt in 2019. But it went bankrupt, but leaving the government of Papua New Guinea with a debt of $125 million because of its part ownership in the, in the, in the project. One of the early investors in Nautilus was a man called Jared Barron. Barron has been described as a serial entrepreneur and has a strong background in marketing but no experience in mining. Barron profited greatly when Nautilus went public in 2007, reportedly turning a $226,000 investment into a $31 million profit by the time he divested from the company in 2008. In 2011, the founder of Nautilus Minerals, a man called David Hayden, created another Canadian deep sea mining company, which he called Deep Green, Deep Green Resources. Hayden brought Jared Barron into that company as CEO. Deep Green set its sights on these polymetallic nodules of the Pacific clarion Clipperton zone. A damning investigative journalism expose by the New York Times came out in August of this year it was called Secret Data, Tiny Islands, and a Quest for Treasure on the Ocean Floor. This piece documents the long-term relationship between the now Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority, Michael Lodge, and David Hayden. The article exposes that confidential data held by the International Seabed Authority with regard to very lucrative nodule areas which had been set aside for developing countries was shared with Hayden, leading ultimately to these areas becoming concessions of deep green through the sponsorships of Nauru and Tonga. As CEO of Deep Green, Jared Barron underwent a dramatic makeover as an eco-warrior, a hipster dude with long hair, leather jackets, and the requisite wrist cuffs. He immediately put his marketing skills to work. Barron, as salesman in chief, sells deep seabed mining at every possible global venue and in social media, and he sells it as necessary to save the planet from climate change. He typically carries a polymetallic nodule around with him, and he pronounces it as a battery in a rock, necessary for expansion of electric vehicles. With typical bravado, he once proclaimed, and I'm quoting, whether you invest in a company like Deep Green or not, everyone is a sucker for the story, unquote. However, Deep Green, like Nautilus before it, was always short of cash. In 2021, Barron decided to take Deep Green public and to change the name to the metals company in a bid to raise capital from investors. Just before the public offering, the metals company's partner nation, Nauru, helped the metals company in its pitch to would-be investors by triggering a never-before-used rule of the International Seabed Authority, one that has been described as a nuclear option. Because once triggered, it allows mining companies to apply to start mining the seabed within two years. And I, I know that uh, this was also discussed by Matt. And they can mine the seabed even if the regulations, they can apply to mine, uh, mine the seabed, even if the regulations and guidelines for the mining are not complete yet. By triggering the two-year rule, Nauru allowed its partner, the Canadian company, the metals company, to announce to investors that it could potentially start mining as early as mid-2023. Regardless of progress in rule development at the International Seabed Authority. It's not hard to understand why Nauru has pinned its hopes on revenues from deep seabed mining. Nauru is a 21 square kilometer Pacific Island country with a population of about 10,000 people that has been devastated by phosphate strip mining for over a century. This phosphate strip mining has made about 80% of Nauru's um, land base uninhabitable. 
It is very dismaying, however, that a small desperate country partnered with a cash poor startup mining company, both have their hopes pinned on an experimental form of mining that will destroy deep sea habitats and biodiversity in the common heritage of humankind. With cascading effects up the water column and as yet unknown consequences for marine health over large areas of the ocean. As it turns out, taking the metals company public has not led to the, wind, to the investment windfall that Barron had hoped for. The company has now traded at under a dollar for over a month and is threatened with removal from the stock exchange in the US. In its def desperate push to start mining as soon as possible, the metals company through its Nauru subsidiary Nori applied to the International Seabed Authority for a permit to conduct a collector test, essentially a mining expedition, in which the metals company would gather some 3,600 tons of nodules over the course of a 38-day expedition in the Clarion Clipperton zone. So this was um, sold or, or explained as being part of its exploration activities. The, but this would be the most nodules that had ever been mined from the, from the deep sea bed. Nori conducted a deeply flawed and truncated public consultation process on its environmental impact statement for the collector test. The data that Nori provided and the critical feedback it received led the legal and technical committee of the International Seabed Authority to agree in July of this year with many of the comments that stakeholders had submitted that the metals company's Nauru subsidiary, Nori, had not provided sufficient data in its revised environmental impact statement to allow it to, to start a collector test. However, suddenly in September, the metals company announced that it had the International Seabed Authority approval to conduct its collector test. We later found out that the surprise approval was achieved via email under a so-called silence procedure. The International Seabed Authority, Authority Secretariat emailed all LTC, this is the legal and technical committee members, um, members of the legal and technical committee, saying that a smaller working group had met virtually and reviewed new information provided by Nori and was now recommending approval. A note of the working group review was attached to the email and the legal and technical committee was given 72 hours to object. No one responded to the email, so the decision was passed. None of the information provided by the metals company and Nori that led to this surprise permission to conduct the collector test has been shared with stakeholders who had been involved in the consultation process. And now we have information from another New York Times article from just last month that, and I'm quoting, the test mission has experienced some mishaps, including electrical wiring failures related to deep sea pressure and the dumping of rock fragments and sediment laden wastewater from the ship, unquote. This means that in its initial test run, the metals company has already experienced an unauthorized dumping of materials brought up from the deep sea bed into the surface waters of the sea. But the metals company has not provided any images or detailed data about this failure, this failure to protect the marine environment from contamination. And the International Seabed Authority has been silent on any consequences for the company for, the, for, for this first of what could become many acts of pollution of the ocean by industrial mining of the seabed. I'll leave it there, but I, I hope you get a, an idea of just how um, you know, concerning it is that the companies that are involved are not being acting responsibly and the authority that is meant to protect the international seabed for all of us is also not acting responsibly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Many applause as well for you uh, inside the room here in Canada. So uh, in Canada in Montreal. <laughs> I know you are in Canada as well. Um, so our next speaker will be Susanna Fuller. Um, as I said earlier, she's the Vice President, President of Operations and Projects at Ocean North 
Canada, based in Halifax. And she'll tell us more about what we know of Canada's position to date and what can we expect both domestically and internationally. Um, so thank you. Um, and it's sort of, I find it interesting and maybe a little of a, of a symbolic that, you know, the countries of the world are just down the hill talking about, well, hopefully reaching an agreement on, um, you know, the, the plan for the future of biodiversity on the planet and that we are up here talking about really almost 70% of the planet, which is the ocean. Um, and it's, clear, I think, too, even the fact that hackers do think that, you know, that's not, that's very much on purpose, that this issue is a really, really important one, one that is still very out of sight and out of mind, um, because the, the the high seas in the bottom of the ocean is always a bit out of sight and out of mind, um, despite the many wonders of the sea and all of the good work that scientists and, you know, um, photographers and artists do to try and bring that to life. Um, so, I, a similar thing really has happened in Canada that the 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 issue of deep sea bed mining, despite the fact, as as Catherine has noted, that both Nautilus and the metals company or Deep Green are registered in Canada. Canada is a um, I wouldn't. It's a little bit of a flag of convenience in a way for many mining companies, and in particular these two. Um, Canada has not been paying a lot of attention to this issue over the last decade. Um, it's changing now, which I'm I'm really pleased to see, and and that you know has been the result I think of a lot of NGO outreach and the um, you know the focus that the fact that the company is actually registered in Canada. So right now, Canada does not have a formal political mandate or position on deep sea bed mining, um, either within its own waters or at the International Seabed Authority. Um, one of the things that we've noticed over time, and, and my colleagues who have followed you know, the, the meetings at the um, International Seabed Authority, is that Canada would have one staff person there who was a staff from Global Affairs Canada, whose file on the International Seabed Authority was extremely side of desk, right? So um, and, and, you know, at the time that staff, you know, that staff person would bemoan that other departments were not engaged, right? He didn't have any help on this issue, which is a major issue, right? Starting a whole new industry, um, particularly around mining is something that I would think as a Canadian citizen and a scientist and an environmentalist that Canada should be on top of, right? So, um, in the last two years, um, I think with some significant NGO pressure and lots of questions being asked, particularly after we noticed that there was a period of about six years where Canada did not submit on, on the aspects of the International Seabed Authority, whether it was on stakeholder consultation, there was no submission. On the regulations, no submission. Canada really hadn't staffed up and doesn't didn't have the capacity to, to adequately to respond to um, the International Seabed Authority and the processes that were being undertaken um, around regulation, environmental impact assessment, consultation. Um, and it's kind of not the Canada we've come to know in the last seven years, right? We've, you know, I remember in 2015, Canada's back. Canada's not quite back on this file. <laughs> um, so what has happened recently is that there is now a... Um, several departments, there's Fisheries and Oceans Canada, NRCAN, Global Affairs, Environment and Climate Change Canada, all have um, staff who have at least this as part of their job. Um, at the International Seabed Authority, the Canadian delegation is led by Global Affairs. Global Affairs is not the department we come to rely on in terms of leading on environmental issues. But they do because of the Law of the Sea Convention, where, where the Office of the Law of the Sea Convention is in global affairs. When things get to negotiation, so at, we're in the middle of, um, the world's in the middle of negotiating a, a, a treaty for protecting high seas biodiversity, that is led by global affairs. Um, our delegation at the International Seabed Authority is led by global affairs. And despite what we think about an all-of-government approach, um, there has not been one on deep sea bed mining. I am glad, you know, glad to say that now there is a, a multi-departmental, um, at least delegation to the ISA, and that is now triggering down to discussions in Canada. Uh, we sent a letter that was signed by 19 um, environmental organizations and Indigenous groups back in. February 2020. It took a full two years to get a 
a substantive response from the Canadian government on that letter because they did not know who should respond. So we would get a letter from the Minister of NRCAN saying, thank you very much for your letter. My colleague in DFO will respond to you. We would get a letter from Minister of Environment. Thank you very much for your letter. My colleague in NRCAN will respond to you. <laughs> so it was a bit of a hot potato. They were passing this issue around between ministries because no one had a domestic mandate. Um, so in, I'd say in the last six months, we've been having very close discussions with um, government staff. There was a move um, or a thought to look at, they, they realized that they don't have a domestic mandate and therefore having an international mandate is difficult. Like as we see down the hill at CBD, people's countries' positions are very much based on, on, their, on their national laws. What can they achieve you know, from a global perspective within their own legal frameworks? So Canada does not have a legal framework for mining the seabed domestically. We don't have a legal framework for not mining the seabed domestically. Um, and we've been pushing them to articulate a moratorium within Canadian waters and then move to actually put that in law, which they can do through the Oceans Act as an example. Um, we've also been... Um, under the Fisheries Act, the mining effluent regulations essentially make it, it's illegal to dump mining effluent into the ocean. So if one were to mine the, you know, critical minerals, um, that would, you would be dumping into the ocean. Um, but what we do do is mine sand and gravel sometimes in the ocean and we dredge, right, in coastal areas. So there's, um, I think really they're trying to figure out like what, if you, we're not going to stop sand and gravel mining right now, we, we may be able to, but they really don't have the legal and policy um, and any cohesiveness within Canada. So our first step really is to get that, is to get them to commit to a moratorium within Canadian waters and to not develop the legal regime. Now, one of the interesting things is there's not actually a legal basis to determine a moratorium. So we have a moratorium on Arctic oil and gas, for example, because we have a legal basis to declare that moratorium. We have a moratorium on oil and gas drilling on George's Bank off the coast of Nova Scotia because we have a legal basis under the um, Atlantic Accord Agreements to establish that moratorium. So... What has to happen is that the, the three, four government departments need to come together and we're really pushing the ministers to do so that the staff do not have a ministerial mandate. And so often when you go to, you know, the International Seabed Authority or CBD or, you know, Climate Cop, um, you would have a ministerial mandate. This is Canada's mandate that has been discussed at cabinet. The issue of deep sea bed mining has not been discussed at cabinet. We have raised it with a prime minister um, who hadn't was not aware of the issue and is now asked for briefing notes on the issue. So we're trying to get this to be really recognized and seen as something that can be stopped. Um, the other piece is um, it, at the ISA, there is this issue of effective control. And the question, what that means is unclear, but I we would like Canada to think about effective control of the mining company, right? It is a Canadian company that is using Nauru to, you know, get what it thinks it wants in terms of starting to mine. So we are continuing to ask Canada about, do they have effective control over the mining company? <laughs> we don't. Um, and uh, so this is evolving. I think we need Canadians to care. I mean, this is often the thing people, the government of Canada needs to feel that Canada, Canadians want, do not want this to take place. And it's a very difficult thing to get people to really um, get engaged in something that's so far away. Um, but I do think we have to have the conversation. Um, Canada just re released its critical mineral strategy um, and yesterday announced an alliance, sustainable alliance for mining alliance. Um, I do think we need to really push Canada to start to, to say no and um, and to think about this and come up, you know, ideally in the next six months, even before the next International Seabed Authority in March, um, to have a political mandate that is a moratorium. And when Canada talks at the ISA in the last meeting, they are more or less backing up the New Zealand precautionary pause um, that we know it has to fit with Article 145 of UNCLOSE, we can't harm the marine environment, but they're not saying that at a political level. So that's the challenge. And um, some of the organizations that we work with under the Sea Blue umbrella are doing some polling right now uh, to find out what Canadians think so that we at least have a little bit of a litmus test of public opinion on this issue. Uh, and then the other piece, I think we need to really think about 
um, we just don't need these minerals. We have to, we can't just all drive electric cars. We actually have this shift and I'm probably speaking to the choir on this, but in Canada, we haven't really started that conversation about like, we can't just continue this extractive um, lifestyle that we have in Canada. Um, and deep sea bed mining is a way to just stop that. It's so, so rare that we have an opportunity to stop an industry before it starts. It's really a unique opportunity. And it's, I almost think of it's like a, Canada's committed to halting and reversing biodiversity loss. And like, this is one thing we can actually halt, right? Um, we won't have to reverse it. So if we just stop it now. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I think there's hope. I think we need people to push the government of Canada. They're, I would say they're on the precipice once they start to actually talk about it amongst the ministers. And we are hoping that happens. That meeting happens in early January and that Minister Jolie, as Minister of Global Affairs, understands that she's got two big environmental files. One is the International Seabed Authority in Canada's position. And the second is the um, uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty. There's some irony that the International Seabed Authority is negotiating how to exploit the deep sea at the same time that all the same countries, pretty much the same countries who belong to the ISA are also negotiating a new treaty on biodiversity protection. So one would think that you would want to get your protection measures in first and then perhaps discuss, you know, a, a, a comprehensive environmental assessment regime. So that's where we are. Um, I'm feeling hopeful, which is good. I feel more hopeful when I talk about that than I do getting to the global biodiversity framework right now, but you know, there's at least five days left. So. Thank you all for coming and, and making me walk up the hill. Thank you, Susanna. Good. So um, as uh, you all see, uh, we have finished our round, first round uh, of this panel um, presentation. So before going to the um, uh, Q&A uh, segment section of, the, uh, of this presentation, uh, I'll try to summarize quickly what we, we've heard uh, during all these different uh, presentations. So uh, we we all acknowledge now that deep sea mining is a serious threat for uh, not only these local ecosystems, but for all the oceans and, and, and the planet. Um, there is currently a large coalition uh, all across the globe calling for a ban for moratorium on this. Um, and we're not only concerned about the, um, the activities uh, themselves, but uh, as well of because of the lack of um, uh, power of and 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 will and and effective control from the ISC, the uh, International Seabed Authority, and the this concerns and and strong opposition from local affected people all across the world, countries um, are are very um, are very well. Uh, demonstrated um, as Tita Cara exposed it uh, brilliantly. Uh, although corporations are pushing harmful ac activities for their own benefits on an unknown and fragile ecosystem. Um, we've, we've heard the, uh, Susanna just uh, exposed the uh, Canada's absence of leadership action. Um, and so, that's why we are calling for this for this uh, moratorium. So that and and something you just mentioned, it's it's very summarizing. Best uh, the presentation is that we don't need those minerals, and and we have to stop this industry before it starts. So now would be the time. If there's any comments in the room, questions, uh, we have two mics there, one at each side of the room. Um, as I said earlier, unfortunately, we we won't be able to uh, open the um, online uh, space uh, because of the, of the known reasons. Um, but yeah, so please take your time with, uh, uh, take like, we have budgeted like 30 minutes for that. So you have plenty of time here, here for the folks in the room. Um, if you want to address your questions in French, I'll do my best to translate it. And, um, yeah, so the key question can either be for one direct panelist, and we also have in the room uh, remotely uh, Nat Lowry. She's the communication coordinator for the uh, deep sea mining uh, campaign. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it, it, that's her position, yeah. 
and uh, she's uh, based in Australia. So uh, the question can be uh, asked directly to her or to some panelists. So the floor is yours. So I see one intervener here at, at uh, my right. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you to all the panelists and the organizers. Um, this has been a very interesting conference. I, I wanted to speak today because I love the ocean and I had had and, you know encounters with amazing marine animals and had a chance to illustrate new and exciting places underwater. And but I also come from a background of UN involvement and uh, being an economist and a uh, business uh, person. And I kind of I wanted to make a parallel with uh, deep sea drilling for oil. Um, I was privy to conversations with bankers kind of saying, wow, this doesn't that deep in the ocean is probably not that safe. And uh, but our models are made to say big risks, big rewards. So we we encourage people to take risks in the business world. Um, and that being said, this bank was also the one who financed submerf submerfaces. So the vehicles that we use, scientists and businesses to explore the underwater uh, seabeds uh, were financed by these same banks that uh, were able to, to give us this whole new view of the world that we never had access to before. So there are tra there, there's, there's nuances that I wanna bring to the table. Um, I was also privy to the insurance company that was responsible for BP uh, acting in the, the Gulf of Mexico. And they were able to reassure their salespeople that uh, everything was fine. They wrote it all off in one quarter and they were moving on to the next <laughs> for profits. So um, I, I'd like to get your point of, I, I know you're proposing a moratorium, but uh, I use metal, we all use metal. We, we need resources uh, even as we move forward. So how do you, you know, make these, uh, take these, you know, the good and the bad and try to make the best of it. Um, Excellent question. I'm sure everyone around the table has something to say, but uh, who wants to uh, jump jump in? Oh, yeah, no, Matt. No, it's, it's a very good question. And it's the kind of uh, assertion that the deep sea bed mining industry or the nascent deep sea bed mining industry makes about the need to go into the deep sea and get these metals because the world needs more um, uh, nickel and cobalt in particular. There are only four metals associated with these nodules that are that are economically recoverable. Manganese, cobalt, nickel, and copper. And it's the nickel that they argue that we really need. Um, but the reality is that, um, well, several realities. Number one is, that the electric vehicle manufacturing industry is moving away from uh, expensive metals such as nickel and cobalt toward cheaper metals that, in fact, make for safer batteries, iron phosphate. And so, for example, the world's largest electric vehicle manufacturing company, BYD, it's a Chinese company, uh, only sells uh, uh, vehicles with lithium iron phosphate batteries as opposed to lithium nickel manganese cobalt batteries, uh, which are the kind of the high performance batteries. Um, Tesla introduced nickel iron phosphate batteries into its lower end models in China in 2019. Today, they're selling over half the vehicles that they're selling worldwide have lithium iron phosphate batteries. No nickel, no copper, uh, no nickel, no cobalt, no need to get these metals either from the Congo or from the deep sea. And there's a tremendous amount of investment going into battery manufacturing because the batteries, the the the, the industries that uh, are are doing this know that there's going to there are huge there's a huge market out there as so many automobile manufacturing companies, other renewable energy companies, and so forth are setting targets for transitioning away from fossil fuels to um, you know electric uh, storage batteries or or batteries for electric vehicles. So you have that. But number two, even if you said, okay, we need to double, and this is what, for example, the, the, the metals company argues, you know, you need to, you need to uh, uh, mine 50 million uh, tons of new nickel uh, to in order to uh, uh, build a billion electric vehicles to basically replace the current global fleet. To do that would, is impossible. 
it's not going to come from the deep sea. The way the ISA operates, the way that this industry is developing, if we're going to be waiting to get the metals we need to transition to renewable energy uh, economies from the deep sea, um, we'll, it, we'll probably have to wait until we get three degrees, four degrees centigrade before enough of that comes out of the deep ocean. What we need to do, in my view, is to transition to the use of, of low impact materials um, uh, and technologies that lose, use low impact metals and materials that are easily sourced from anywhere in the world um, and not just from one or a handful of countries. Um, and to build uh, 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 technologies or to build vehicles, build electronic devices and so forth that we can recycle, that, uh, that uh, can be reused, uh, that don't, uh, aren't, um, you know, automatic, don't, don't have a, a planned obsolescence, um, and, and make much better use of the metals and the materials that we already have. And one of the, one of the, 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 um, the statistics that I find most striking is that from the International Trans uh, the Telecommunications Union, which puts out periodic reports on electronic waste and how much is generated every year and how much is recycled. And basically they say, over 50 million tons of electronic waste are being generated per year, of which less than 20% is recycled. And in talking to, for example, a senior manager, a season sustainable technology manager at Apple a couple of years back, he said, well, we should at least get that figure up to 80% before we even think about going into the deep ocean to mine. So there are alternatives. And there are alternatives, and I think in the broader context, and I think Catherine was mentioning this, that we, we need as a society to start thinking, to, to seriously transition away from just single use and overconsumption and so forth, um, and, 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 and build what we need to build with much more responsible terrestrial mining where it's needed. Um, and much better use of what we've already mined and 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 find materials and metals and so forth that that, that don't have the kind of environmental impacts that uh, mining nickel does in some cases on land and and, and and that would have in the deep sea and 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 uh, you know make much better use of what we've got I mean we really have to do this you know live within planetary boundaries but let me stop there thank you Matt anyone else want to jump on this question add anything? Susanna? Yeah, just quickly. I mean, one of the things that um, we've actually encouraged Canada to look into is the financing regime at the International Seabed Authority. Um, there's a promise, not, a, you know, no, it's not even a promise. It's like a hy hy hypothetical idea that some of the Pacific Island states, um, you know, could get very rich or could at least get money. We did not, with Nautilus, I mean, Papua New Guinea ended up very much in the hole. Um, and so we've encouraged Canada to do more substantive work on the financing regime because we think that by them putting energy into that and being quite literate on it and bringing other countries along, the financing, you know, for other countries really doesn't work. And that is for the high seas and the, the area where, you know, in theory, we're supposed to share resources. Um, so, yeah, I, I absolutely get your point. I just think that we're not going to be able to achieve the things that we've promised to do, whether it's net zero or protect or, you know, improving outcomes for biodiversity and at the same time continue on, you know, this the same kind of economic model we've been on, right? That that has to shift. We can't have it both ways. And so that I think is the struggle that we're in. Um, and that's a decision, right? Thank you, Susanna. Uh, Catherine, Matt? Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, I, I think I think the other thing that we really need to look at and what I tried a little bit to sketch for you is just the fact that the mining that's being promoted by Canadian companies like the Metals Company and the rush with which they're trying to get out there and get their permits and start mining has nothing to do really with you know, giving us the metals that we need or saving the planet from climate change. It's profit-based mining, just as the mining is on land. And so they're they're spinning a story and they're, you know, they're quite, a, Jared Barron at least, you know, is quite aware of that. He says it's a story for suckers. But, um, you know, if, if, if they really were concerned about saving the planet, and doing it in a responsible way, they wouldn't be triggering a two-year rule that would allow them to start mining before 
the rules or regulations are in place to do this properly. And if we listen to the science, if we listen to the scientists, they have put out a paper recently to say, well, how long would it take to have a better understanding of what this ecosystem is actually all about before we destroy it? And if there was a concerted effort, putting the, the pressure of starting mining aside and just focusing on the science, just focusing on actually understanding this ecosystem, because you can't mine an ecosystem responsibly if you don't even know what the ecosystem is, how it functions, how it relates to the rest of, of, of all of the habitat around the deep sea bed. And if they were to just focus on that, put all the energy, put all the resources into that, even then, at best, it would take seven years of concerted effort for marine scientists around the world that, that have any understanding of this, this ecosystem to be able to come up with a better a better picture of what is down there and how it relates to all the other all the other species that are above in the water column. And so, you know, if if these companies were really concerned about saving the planet, they wouldn't be trying to push uh, the International Seabed Authority, nation states like Tonga and Nauru and Kiribati into mining as quickly as possible. And we've already seen through the collector test that was done that should never have been allowed to go ahead, you know, that when you do rush, bad things happen. And then we don't even find out about them. We don't, we aren't told. We get a glimmer that something went wrong from a New York Times article, but the company has not come clean and neither has the International Seabed Authority. And that worries me greatly. At least with mining on land, we can have eyeballs on those projects. We can see what's going on. So I think from that perspective, both from the perspective, as Matt was saying, that we really don't need these metals to go forward. And there sh we should be, as a species, reaching a point where we don't rely on primary new mined metals for everything that we need. Um, we also really need to be skeptical about this particular new mining rush. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I know Tita as well raised her hand. So uh, Tita, if you want to open your camera, or if not, it's fine too. Um, it's just so we can see you now. So, okay, now we can see you. We can't hear you now. Still don't. Okay, thank you. Um, Here we are. We can hear you. Thanks. I am, to be honest, I'm quite hurt um, when the statement say big risk means big reward because um, the reference to the Pacific Islands um, eventually becoming bridge um, as a result of DCC mining, we all know that is a myth. We look down at history to Africa or any other um, small poor country who have raw materials, you know, they have been led by that carrot. They will eventually get rich. You'll be given this, you'll be given this. And we know they're all tokenism. They've built a bridge that does not actually last long. They'll build a school that does not have any windows or, or teachers. So these, that false promises, but I, 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 I I'll go back to the issue of, you know, we need these minerals. I don't think we do. We already have enough. And this, it's an era of uh, consumerism, you know, and that bottom bit hunger for new things, fast, fast everything. You know, this propagation of marketing stunt that um, Donald Metal companies and the likes are actually selling, for everyone to hop onto that bag wagon and ride with it. Um, you know, Matt has already said it, we have enough of the minerals um, around to recycle, reposition them, and to slow down that fast moving um, kind of attitude that humanity is having, keep hungering for new things and, you know, brand new shiny stuff all the time. And the expenses of a poor country like us who have to give us or give up so much of 
you know, of our resources to feed that, you know, that hunger. Um, and also to just say that, you know, if this company was really, really honest, like uh, Catherine was saying about, you know, caring for humanity and, you know, the whole green wash about the climate change, they have been down there for over a decade now. They have been campaigning, you know, sending their ship. Why don't if why don't they already come up with solution of you know the impact of blooming, the impact of noise, the impact of light, the impact of vibration that will happen down there? Because it was never their focus. They never care about that. You know, it's somebody else's property, out of mind, out of sight. So that's all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you, Tita. Um, so we have another speaker in the room. So. Uh... Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. I wasn't too aware of uh, all these issues, well, from very far, so that's really a, an eye-opener. Thank you for that. Uh, this whole story reminds me a bit of uh, this uh, scramble for space mining. Uh, you know, decided that we're going to be, get insanely rich by mining asteroids. Even though the technology doesn't exist, uh, the, uh, the people are seeking subsidies and financing, and the, the entire scheme seems to be designed to uh, separate fools from their money, <laughs> as is often the case. And uh, what you, you were talking about today uh, sounds awfully uh, the same. I mean, these companies don't have to be uh, to have a very solid technical expertise. They don't have much money. Uh, they don't know exactly what they're doing. There's no science backing that. And even if we forget for a moment about uh, the environmental impacts that seem extremely concerning, uh, even if we forget about this, is this scheme, can this scheme really be profitable to someone, to the company, and even more to the people uh, that they're supposed to be helping in some way? It seems to me that they are separating the fools from their money on the back of the local people in the Pacific who are going to pay the ultimate price. Uh, how do you feel about that? Thanks a lot. Um, anyone? I'd like to answer, but I'd defer to Pacific colleagues if they want to uh, uh, okay. speak to that. Tita, uh, do you want to respond anything we are, to that? We also have Nat and as well Catherine operating in the Pacific, but yeah, not. I yeah, see yeah, you're I'm, opening I'm, your mic. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, respond. I, I really love separating the fools from their money. I think that could be a line we could be quoting as uh, as sort of campaign comms. So I um, very much appreciate your reflections and thoughts because um, absolutely you, we agree. And, you know, these are speculators and cowboys that are playing this game with deep sea mining and, you know, uh, stretching this sort of narrative, this double false narrative that we need these minerals when we know we don't, as as Matt and Susanna and Tita and Catherine had just spoken to. And you only really have to look at the case of uh, Papua New Guinea with Nautilus Minerals, which Catherine had mentioned, uh, Gerard Baron, who is the CEO of the metals company, um, he managed to pull out of Nautilus and make quite a fair millions of dollars before um, its demise. But the result of Nautilus Minerals in the waters of Papua New Guinea, where the first um, deep sea mine has been given a green light to operate, although obviously it hasn't started operations, um, you know, Nautilus pretty much went bankrupt. But the Papua New Guinean government was left out of pocket $157 million, you know, so it's... It's investors maybe who become fools, but it's also governments and unfortunately the citizens of those countries and in Papua New Guinea, where they're in desperate need for, you know, education and health, you know, this money that has just 
disappeared um, because of this ridiculous venture um, is is a real shame, you know. And and as a result of that, and I guess the positive spin on that is there's this incredible movement in Papua New Guinea, um, led by the Alliance of Solwari, well, Solwara Warriors. Solwara meaning the sea, salt water. Um, across uh, six provinces of the Bismarck and Solomon Seas. So they're currently fighting very hard for all the licenses, and there's many licenses across those two seas to be cancelled and for a complete ban, um, not just in the waters of PNG, but also um, internationally. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we've we've looked into the economics. There really isn't economics except for the cowboys out there who will speculate and, you know, take the millions and run away, um, leaving particularly Pacific Island states in a situation where they're not going to benefit and those, those that money is not going to filter down to the communities that, that need it. So, yep, it's not wanted. It's not ever needed, deep sea mining. I don't know, Tita, if you wanted to also <laughs> respond to that. Yes, Tita. Thanks, Nat. Thank you. I have to be in mute by the host. Um, thank you, Nat. That was really clearly said. Um, and also the thinking um, when we're talking about this, I'm reminded of the cartoon of um, Joker and Batman. The Joker being the troublemaker, you know, he made trouble and fat men tried to clean up. But um, we see ourselves as Batman and these companies are the Jokers. But the sad thing about it is they are holding us hostage, you know, using deep sea mining and our own poverty as the carrot. Um, not knowing by a lot of our leaders is deep sea mining is a loaded gun that the Joker is holding to our head. And the government is holding the trigger. You know, um, Nauru has slowly pulled their trigger. You know, whether there will be a ban um, next year or not, uh, but the impact will be felt by the whole Pacific Island. Um, so it's no joke to the likes of me who witness every day the impact of the pollution that's already happening to our ocean. This is a loaded gun that is now landed right next to our head and we're begging and praying that the trigger will not be pulled. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, Matt? If I could say a few words. Yeah, yeah thanks, sure. Tita, and thanks, Nat. Uh, just, just on the economics of this, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, kind of following from the, the, the original question as well, um, the United Nations Environment Program Financial Initiative had a look at deep sea bed mining, issued a report this year on deep sea bed mining, basically saying um, it's not needed and encouraging investors uh, to actually invest in improving the practices of terrestrial mining operations and invest in circular economy initiatives as a way to basically get us to transition to uh, renewable energy economies. Um, I mentioned the European Investment Bank, their, their, their primary lend, uh, uh, um, motivation, not motivation, but their primary purpose for lending is for climate change initiatives. They don't see the need for deep sea metal mining to, to, to provide the materials and the metals necessary to transition. The UK House of Commons issued a report in 2019 three main conclusions on deep sea bed mining. One, it will be catastrophic to the areas of the seafloor where the mining takes place. Two, the International Seabed Authority has an inherent conflict of interest as both the beneficiary of the mining licenses it will hand out and the regulator to ensure that they don't do damage to the environment. Um, and, uh, you know, just, oh, and that the case for deep sea bed mining is the third major conclusion has not yet been made, i.e. that society needs to go and mine the deep sea to do it. However, it could be very profitable. And what's happened is that the International Seabed Authority, in addition to negotiating exploitation regulations and grappling with this two-year rule that uh, Catherine explained so well, uh, is also trying to negotiate a financial regime, a royalty regime. How much can the International Seabed Authority charge mining companies for the licenses it would issue to go mine these nodules in particular uh, out in the middle of the Pacific? And basically what MIT has concluded is that the world will not make much money off this. 
uh, but individual companies could. Uh, they estimate that the mining operations uh, uh, producing or, or meeting the production uh, targets that have been discussed at the ISA, it's 3 million tons of nodules per year, um, could be worth about $2.5 billion uh, a year. And that operating costs could be somewhere in the vicinity of 600 million to $1.2 billion. So quite a wide profit margin, although then you have to take into consideration corporate taxes, the so-called capex costs, the cost of paying back the uh, the capital and the interest on the capital that's borrowed to build the uh, equipment and so forth to go mining, and, and and corporate taxes in the jurisdictions of the countries that would sponsor them. But we know, for example, in the case of Nauru, Nauru will charge no corporate tax. This came out in the uh, the uh, uh, filings that um, the that the metals company had to make with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We know that the green is not looking necessarily to borrow money to then have to pay back an interest on it, but to um, um, uh, get companies uh, to buy into deep green, to become shareholders and uh, go into the venture capital markets or, 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 or companies themselves to then make a profit by the increase in the value of the shares. The real concern we have is, as I mentioned earlier, once the door is open to mining, if it proves profitable, the International Seabed Authority basically has to give every country that applies for a mining license an opportunity to do so. And, you know, corporations like the metals company will go to countries um, with low populations, uh, low income developing countries to get them to sponsor them to get the licenses at the ISA because they know they can pay very little money in corporate taxes. A little bit of money goes a long way to a country, for example, with a population of 10,000. And they know that these countries, unlike, for example, Canada, are going to be much more difficult positioned to actually be regulating the industry. And under the law of the sea convention, the country that sponsors the mining company is co-responsible with the International Seabed Authority to ensure that a mining company abides by all the rules. And so, for example, Deep Green is a kind of a fly-by-night co company, Gerard Barron, you know, the, as Nat has said, but they've got two big backers, Glencore and All Seeds, which is investing its own money. And you probably haven't heard of All It's a privately held company, but it was the one that was built, built the Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Russia and uh, Germany that uh, has been the subject of much uh, uh, contention. And our fear is that once, you know, the first goers go and they prove profitable, um, it's going to be extremely difficult to keep other big companies out of it. We've, we've been contacted by Anglo-American, for example. They've said, what do you think? You know, we're hearing that this may be, you know, a sustainable way to get the metals we want to, you know, no, no, no. So, I mean, companies are really sniffing around the edges of this issue and looking and looking at it. And, of course, one of the three big companies that does have exploration licenses in the Clarion Clipperton zone, together with the metals company and um, a company based in Belgium called GSR, is Lockheed Martin, the American arms manufacturer uh, company. And they're looking at potential sources of deep sea bed metals to build weapons, you know, um, and not to transition necessarily to renewable energy economy. So, so there's, you know, there's a lot kind of, there's a lot in this cauldron, so, you know, kind of being put into this mix, and it could go any number of different ways, which is, you know, you know, in addition to the scientific and environmental concerns, and, 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 and these are added reasons why we're calling for a moratorium. Until this stuff gets sorted out, until the countries that have created the ISA are willing to reform it and change its direction and its mandate toward protecting the environment rather than trying to facilitate uh, uh, opening up the deep ocean to mining, uh, there should be no uh, issuing of any licenses or adoption of any regulations. And little by little, we're, we're getting more countries to agree with this. But on the finally, just, just to say on the question of, um, you know, do we need these metals to, 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 to transition, you know, to, do we need more metals? I mean, you could argue we should, it, we, we could cut down the entire Amazon rainforest and convert it into soya plantations and raising cattle. And that would help us feed a growing world population that may go to 10 billion people in the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. But is that, re do we really have to do that? Is that the smartest choice we as a society can make? You know, we have better choices. We have better choices as consumers. We have better choices uh, as companies in terms of their ESG policies and their corporate social responsible policies, and in particular, better choices that governments can make in, in incentivizing or otherwise investing in renewable energy technologies uh, and, and, and in that transition that we truly need to make and make quickly uh, away from fossil fuels. 
uh, rather than create a whole new problem, open up a whole new frontier of biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, um, and, and potential impacts on how the oceans actually regulate our climate by going into the deep sea to try to get this stuff. So, I, you know, that's, I, I think it's, it's a question of choices as much as anything else. And, and we're arguing with countries, please make the right choice. You can do it. Uh, deep sea bed mining isn't inevitable. It's not going to happen uh, it, it will, it, it, in the international areas in the world's oceans unless countries agree to allow it to happen. And it's the responsibility is on, on the Canadian government, on the U.S. government, on the members of the European Union, on Tonga, on the Australian government, and the other members, the 167 member countries of the ISA. So, and, and they have to make clear decisions on this because now we're triggered the two-year rule within the next one to two years. Uh, it's a really critical time uh, that uh, the, the decisions will be, be made at, at, at that body. Thanks, Matt. Susanna, do you want to add anything? Would be um... <laughs> I'll my, um, I think um, you know one of the things that we wanted to get out of the CBD, which is not it's not done yet, but is just at least better language um, on on what is expected from an environment, you know, from a biodiversity perspective for deep sea bed mining, and kind of put enough a precaution ecosystem approach um, in the language to make it harder. Um, for for the ISA to move forward, and if Matt, if you want to speak to the the work in trying to get the CBD to move things forward, and it's always incremental, right? Like it's not, all of this is like unrelenting and incremental work. <laughs> um, and so I just want to say that what's you know CBD does matter because one, it's a place to raise um, awareness about this um, activity. There, you know, we are convening some ministers together, some of the ministers in the countries who have. Um, indicated that they want a moratorium, a ban, a precautionary pause, and trying to get them all sort of aligned on a position that that's, you know, we're working on that. But I just wondered, did you want to speak to, you know, where we are in the language and why it's important in the marine and coastal biodiversity, even though that language is now unbracketed, if anybody's been down there, the brackets are, you know, a thing. Um, but trying to, just trying to like, like, move all these international processes and domestic pro domestic processes is like it's like all hands on deck and unrelenting and and incremental but i just thought because there has there has been some discussion yeah been, yeah, yeah. yeah no that's it's been it's been there's been some some significant negotiation on the issue of deep sea bed mining um last week and now we'll see what happens uh later on in this week but we're if, if things hold the way they are there will be some useful you know useful call for action uh, coming out of the CBD on deep sea bed mining. It's not nearly as strong as we would have liked. We would have liked to hear a clear call for action from the convention, you know, the conference of parties to the convention on biological diversity that the world should not create a whole new frontier of biodiversity loss. Uh, while most of what the governments are at least committing to doing in, in, in uh, verbally is to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030, for example, uh, the leaders pledge, although these kind of commitments have gone all the way back to the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002 to halt biodiversity loss. Um, but we're seeing, you know, the mining, not necessarily mining industry interests here, but certainly governments that are considering mining, because the, the other thing that's driving this is countries are looking at the possibility of maybe in the future, they might want to mine the deep ocean um, to supply critical raw materials for their industries or their militaries or whatever. And when you look at the exploitation, exploration licenses that have been issued by the ISA to date, 31 altogether, 18 in the hand, are in the hands of seven countries, China, Russia, Japan, Korea, Germany, India, and France. And another seven are in the hands of the three companies that we've been talking about today. And it's the countries that actually have the license, these, these 18 licenses. And, they're, and it's their national agencies or state-owned companies that, that actually get the contracts to do the exploration uh, with the ISA. So there is state interest in saying, well, maybe we're not ready to mine now, but we might want to have in reserve these areas in the future in case global conflict uh, uh, puts a squeeze on supplies that we our industries domestically need. Um, and, and that's something that we're also having to contend with, and, and including here in the uh, COP negotiations uh, this past week. But in spite of that, you know, and, and it was heartening that some of the countries 
that were involved in the small group negotiations to come up with compromise actually ended up with compromise language that was much stronger than any of the proposals but one going into the meeting this week. And it will call for no harm to biodiversity in the marine environment from deep sea bed mining. So that I think for us at least, if that call holds, will be useful to then go into the next round of negotiations at the International Seabed Authority, which will take place in March, and say, you got a clear call from one of your peers, the Convention on Biological Diversity to the International Seabed Authority to basically not do anything if it's going to cause biodiversity loss, and, and, and that will help. Thank you, Matt. I see there's other uh, interventions in the room. Unfortunately, we will soon have to finish the uh, panel because we have to leave in the room in 10 minutes. So I... Uh, I'm hoping that you 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 can share your your uh, words, but uh, I would uh, sincerely ask you to do it quick because I, I'd like to uh, give the final words to uh, Tita and Nat. Um, so uh, yeah, in a couple thank, of minutes. Thank thanks. you, and I will be quick. Okay, um, outside of these very high level processes and acknowledging that that which happens in the Pacific also happens everywhere on the ocean and indeed on the land because it's all one system. What can we ordinary citizens who don't have a lot to do with these high international processes do to make sure this does not happen? Thank you. Okay, good. And it was written in, in my conclusion. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad you, uh, you, you take this uh, to my plate. But first, maybe we can uh, have Nat and Tita to, uh, for closing remarks. Sure. Um, I think there's a few kind of key actions. One is to make sure your government, particularly if they're a member of the International Seabed Authority, um, to really make a stand and join the moratorium call. And uh, Matt can speak really well to that because the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition has been a force to reckon with in that space. Um, and there's also some, you know, more kind of online actions. One is Pacific Blue Line, pacificblueline.org. That is uh, a Pacific-wide uh, Pacific Conference of Churches, civil society across the Pacific who are calling for an outright ban um, on deep sea mining. Um, and that includes um, Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining. They're also calling for a ban. There's about 15 plus parliamentarians across the Pacific, as well as also there is a global parliamentarians calling for moratorium. Um, and there's also another action, um, and I've forgotten the, <laughs> I've forgotten the website, um, but maybe I'll share it in, I can't even, I can put it in the chat and maybe you could um, just read it out. I'll just have to look for it. But I'll pass over to Tita because I think um, the most important thing is really to be able to really stand with the frontline communities who have been fighting this for over a decade. Um, and that is very much specific communities, although, you know, we're seeing this can possibly open up in other areas. And, you know, we have strong contingent in the Caribbean and Africa and also Latin America that are really starting, you know, in terms of coastal communities that are really starting to become aware of this issue. So I hand it over to Tita um, and thank you, everyone, for um, coming to the space. Thank you, Nat. Tita? Thank you. Um, and I think a, a lot of what I would have said have been covered by Nat. Thank you very much. Um, I think the final statement from me, um, I'm finally slowing down the interpreter, is that this is a Pacific um, fight because we are up in the front liners. But this is a global issue. So what can you do? you know, in your everyday life, like I do here, you know, share as much as you can on the issue, share information, even the blue peril, and expect hackers like we had today. You will have to meet them and your own family, your own church, your own country, your friends, expect them. But that is part of the fight. And the suite of victory, is knowing that we're going to leave a beautiful ocean to the generation who will come. So fight with me, deep sea mining. Thank you. Thank you, Tita.
Thank you, Tita Cara. Thank you, Matt, Gianni. Thank you, Susanna Fodder and Catherine Cummins and, and um, uh, Nat, Laurie as well. So um, yeah, I think that concludes well the uh, panel. I don't even have to uh, say my final words. What can we do? <laughs> so um, uh, thanks for having been with us. And, and the, um, the, the presentation will be uh, published online after a couple of editing, I believe. Um, so uh, yeah was a, an honor to be uh, your facilitator. And I uh, wish for uh, um, uh, Matt and Susanna a good hand of uh, cup. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Okay, goodbye.